Special meeting of the board for our reopening um, hybrid learning update. Uh, it is 7.30 p.m. on September 24th, and I would ask Madam Secretary to note the roll, and we'll go right to the Pledge of Allegiance. All right, as we only have uh, two agenda items, this is kind of common with a, with a special meeting, um, we can go right to our public comments. I know some of you spoke last night, but if you feel compelled to repeat it, by all means. Uh, there were some really great conversation last night, so you are obviously welcome to. Um, so I will uh, read a little disclaimer here. This is the point of the, public, of the meeting where the public is welcome for comments. Please limit your comments to three minutes. However, if several people would like to address the board on the same topic, we will limit the time to two minutes per person. Although comments may be made in almost any matter related to the operation of schools, please do not make comments concerning individual students or staff members. Every person appearing before the board will be treated with courtesy and respect. While it's the practice of the board not to respond to public questions or comments during the meeting, Board members do attentively listen to your comments and carefully consider the thoughts and topics you present. <coughs> Excuse me. You can contact us via phone or email if you wish to discuss things further. So please come forward to the microphone and state your name and address for the minutes prior to speaking. All right. Jennifer Hutzinger. Got it right this time. Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me. My name is Jennifer Hunsaker. I have two kids in third grade here in the district and I live at 316 North Douglas Avenue. I spoke yesterday with Dr. Bynes, so she knows most of what I'm going to say. And I know that she is the final decision maker as I asked her who exactly had the final say and how and when kids go back to school. But I'm speaking to all the rest of you, the board and the community as yet another extremely disappointed and concerned parent community member. As a former elementary school teacher of CCSD 15, who by the way I think is doing a fine job of getting their kids back in person full day, I have a perspective of both an educator and a parent. I believe that kids should be back in 15 are making it happen right now. As I've heard many parents say, and I heard Rich say at a previous meeting, I find most important right now we There should be no lag time once the TAC deems the metrics met for that. The students of this district have lost so much time. Last March, they were without stay at home. They were given a school experience that was lacking. Most of us understood that in such an emergency situation, it was the best we could do. We were told to flatten the curve and to prevent our healthcare systems from being overwhelmed, and we were okay with it. But the kids were cut off from everything, education, socialization with peers, and the continuity of a schedule. As a former teacher, I can tell you that one of the things you on your road to becoming an educator is that children thrive on a schedule. They do better with consistency. If you go with a two-day in-person, three-day remote schedule, not only do they have no consistency, they will continue to get more of the same on-screen learning that we've been relying on since March. These kids are done. My formerly happily, happy to learn kids now dread every day. And make no mistake, it's not on their teachers. They are wonderful. I'm amazed. They're superheroes trying to get these children to engage and grow. My son has anxiety daily on tasks he must complete alone and in silence. There is no comfort of looking around the room to gauge where he's at. My daughter has anxiety every time her Zoom kicks her out and every time the internet fails. We all know that, there, that we need to limit screen time, yet here we are, we're forcing our children to be on there. I feel a little bit like that famous character, the Lorax, right now. In the book, he speaks for the trees. I spoke with several of the teachers in this district, and now I'm speaking on their behalf. This sums up how many of them are feeling. Many of us D25 teachers feel defeated. We are doing our best based on plans that were unprepared and an administration that truly doesn't know what teachers have put into remote learning and what the day looks like and feels like for the kids. A two-day hybrid is double the work for teachers and families and less education. 
We feel like everything that happens right now is a result of the district not being prepared. Many of us just feel tired and know that this could have been avoided. We wonder if it matters what we think at this point at all. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, Mary Ann Corcoran. Hello, Mary Ann Corcoran, uh, 739 South Roosevelt. I spoke yesterday about mental health and child abuse. Today, I want to talk more about children with disabilities. The most recent school report card for 2019 states that 16.5% of District 25 students have some sort of disability, whether that's physical, intellectual, or emotional. Of the $79 million District 25 received in 2019, almost 30% of the district's expenditures are spent on supportive services, approximately $24 million. Experiencing this firsthand as a psychologist and as a mother of a child with a 504, I know how much these kids need and how specialized those services are. I'm happy to hear that the number is high because it shows that the district values these services. But at the same time, I'm very concerned about how $24 million worth of services can possibly be mirrored at home. Parents like me are carrying the burden of ensuring that our child's accommodations are being carried out. Whether it's limiting the distractions at home, making sure they're using their testing accommodations appropriately, helping them stay focused, redirecting them, keeping younger siblings from jumping into their space, we are there. Well, what if the person in charge of the children doesn't speak English? 11.6% of students in District 25 are ELL. Many children can't manage their behavior and follow directions without guidance because that is their specific IEP goal. They need constant redirection, which is now an issue with protecting their privacy as this is happening on Zoom calls. Kids with learning disabilities such as dyslexia, they're typically in general education. Being at home without their aids, they can't follow along with the things that are written on a board or a screen because they can't read them quickly enough. Teachers historically have had their trained eyes on a student's progress and growth while comparing them to their peers. Especially with early education, they are the professionals picking up on the learning challenges and assessing the student's progress. There will naturally be a delay in identification of needs and then a delay in recommending appropriate interventions to address those needs. Currently, these are one-on-one, -on -one, completely skewed results that are different than in-class observations. We're not getting accurate present levels from which we create the goals and then assign services. If the assessment is off, naturally the treatment is off. From start to finish, this is a complicated process. Now add the fact that the kids are at home. How do we create a functional behavioral assessment at home? How do we make and track progress? What is the target behavior and how do we get them there? The answer is that it doesn't work. These children are fa falling farther behind and the only way to fix it is to get them back in the classroom with their incredible teachers, incredible aides, and all of their other supports. It's about equity and access for all students of all abilities to obtain the same level of education. Thank you. Thank you, Miriam. Uh, Brittany, okay. give me a shot here. Pull. Okay. Paul Aronis. Paul uh, Brittany Paul Aronis, 336 West Waverly Court. Um, I just wanted to address Dr. Bynum and the board members. I have been pretty much on weekly emails with all of you, so through this whole thing. Um, as we are now approaching the 196th day that our children last stepped foot into a classroom. I urge you to support parents' right to choose in person, full time, or remote. It is unacceptable that in the last six months we are not able to provide this option to our children that desperately need to be back in school for both social and educational purposes. That the superintendent and the board members continue to delay what science, pediatrician, medical professionals are recommending. As I watch other districts in neighboring towns have solid plans and are now in person full time, our children continue to slip behind. My family moved to District 25 six years ago for my children to receive the best education and get support for my son with an IEP. 
This is not happening. This environment cannot be done in remote, and my children and all of our children deserve the ed best education possible. I urge you, and I will continue to push for my children and all the children to go back. Hybrid is just a step. This is not the destination. This is not the goal. Children need to be in classrooms learning with teachers who are trained, not staring at tiny squares. My first grader cries every night of headaches eye pain, begging me to help her. My son, who has an IEP, says, Mom, I promise I will be good. Will you let me back in school? What is clear is that distance learning isn't just a waste of time. It's actually doing harm to the children. That, and worst of all, it is those we have entrusted with their safety that are putting them in jeopardy. I urge you to consider to push, let's not stop, move forward. Let our children go back to school. Thank you, Brittany. All right, um, Aaron Calloway. Hi, my name is Aaron Calloway, 311 North Belmont Avenue. To echo those sentiments, this morning was the first time my fourth grader ever said the words, I hate school. I have a letter here uh, giving the perspective of a D25 parent and a teacher named Christy Gaduto. She teaches at a Catholic school. She did not have the option to teach in person, which I must say, I think myself and everybody agrees that teachers should have the choice of whether or not to go back in person as parents should have the choice whether or not to send their children. It's equitable for everybody to be able to choose. It's not easy. I think we can figure out how to do that, though. These are her words. I would not want it any other way. I see my students every day thriving in school, not only because of face-to-face -face learning, but because they are kids, and they get to be with other kids not isolated at home. My school has been in session since August 17th. We have had two cases of COVID in the first grade classroom. That class and teachers stayed home for 14 days and are now back in school. I have no fears or worries that I will catch COVID or that I will bring it home to my family. I'm safe at school with my mask and I use hand sanitizer frequently. On another note, my husband's a police officer. He also does not have the option to stay home. He has also been taking all safety precautions such as wearing a mask and changing his clothes, showering when he gets home. I am very happy to say our whole family has been safe and healthy this whole time. In summary, the past seven months and my personal experience has proved to all of us that if we take the necessary precautions, we can assume our normal lives. COVID does not have to stop everything and it especially does not have to stop school. I implore you to please reconsider remote learning and start in-person learning. The only ones hurt by our actions are our children. We are failing them. Thank you for taking the time to read my email. And to close, I myself am a registered nurse. I've been working throughout this time, aside from the short time when I was furloughed in the spring. I agree we can control this virus with hand hygiene, masks, and I think our kids are, and parents are all on board. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron and Christy. Uh, Carrie Hood. Hello again, Carrie Hood, 1025 East Cherry Lane. Um, I'm just gonna read some quotes that I pulled directly from our school's websites as a reminder of who we are and what we teach our kids. Ivy Hill, be courageous. We're on a mission to cultivate learners who are courageous and empowered so they're prepared to tackle any challenge that comes their way. Dryden's reflective and global thinkers. In many respects, we are charged with preparing our students for an uncertain future. That being said, we feel certain that we are preparing our students for a successful and rewarding future. Given our emphasis on embedding reflection, goal setting, relationship building, and community connections throughout a rigorous Inquiry-based curriculum, we are preparing our students to be caring, resilient, self-directed problem solvers. Greenbrier's student growth. We ensure student growth by focusing on the needs of the whole child. 
by building on their strengths while providing support to meet their challenges. Owls, owls for others. The Owls for Others motto is more than just clever phrasing. It is a way of living and learning each and every day within our building. It is a way to create a safe and sustainable learning and growing environment. Patton's love for learning. True learning resonates and is personal, and our teachers are constantly, whoops, sorry, are constantly meeting kids where they are at and giving them what they need. Our teachers monitor, assess, and then adjust to their students, giving them a personalized experience within their classrooms. We also value our students' voices and empower them to make choices within their structured learning environment. South's Cardinal Way. At South, our students embody the Cardinal Way. Our staff models how to be respectful, responsible, safe, and nice, and our students push one another to create a kind and safe environment for learning and socializing. That is what South is about, environment. Thomas's special ed programming. We are extremely proud of our special ed programming. The support our students have access to is unparalleled. This program focuses on the individual needs of our students as we provide occupational therapy, physical therapy, health services, and reading and math intervention. We establish spaces for all of our students to collaborate and interact. Our building is physically built to support all students. Westgate's growing leaders. At Westgate, we believe in our students taking ownership of their learning. We empower our students to become leaders, not only among their peers, but also in their own life and with their own classwork. The community embraces our leader in me ideals and programming. We partner with our parents and families to organize many annual events and gatherings that emphasize our belief in the importance of fostering leadership. Our students are taught to be diligent workers, yet open to the idea that there is more often than one way to look at solving a problem. And Windsor's growth mindset. Having a growth mindset is about building. It's about building strong relationships, strong support, and the tenacity to approach a wall of learning and get curious and find a way over, through, or around the wall. Let's follow what we say. Thank you, Carrie. Heidi Steinecke. My name is Heidi Steinecke. I live at 1722 North Patton Avenue, directly next to Patton School. As a mother of a second grader and a fourth grader, and with over 20 years experience as a pediatric speech pathologist, I can confidently state how detrimental e-learning is to the development of our children's communication, language, and social skills. Regression is happening now. There is no doubt. I retired from my career as a speech pathologist two years ago solely for the half-day kindergarten program D D25 offers. I felt the programming was better than the private school he was attending. Fast forward to, to today. My youngest child right here is in second grade at Patton Elementary. And this is the very same district I rearranged our lives for because I felt it was worth it. It's failing us and all of our children while the private schools are successfully putting children first. Oh, this is hard. I don't need to explain this photo of my son struggling with e-learning because we all know it. We all experience this firsthand. What stands out the most to me in this experience and what is the most appalling is watching e-learning slowly crush my children's spirits and extinguish their innate desire to learn. This picture attached is a picture of my son Claude who used to love school and he now experiences headaches, dry eyes, Zoom fatigue, decreased confidence, sleep issues, difficulty coping with other minor issues that should be nothing, Excess, ex excessive frustration with tech glitches, and the list goes on. And this is only two weeks into e-learning. This was September 15th. This picture shows he cares and he wants to do well. What will this picture look like in two months? You tell me. What will this picture look like? Because he, he's not going to look like this. I'm afraid. My biggest fear is that he's not going to care. It's going to be done. He's going to say, I don't care, and he's going to walk away from the screen. <sighs> this is unacceptable, it's wrong, and it needs to stop. Children need to be in school five days a week, and nothing can replace this experience, nothing. I refuse to continue to watch my kids lose their confidence in subjects they once prevailed. I am now a stay-at-home mom with all the resources I desire to make e-learning work. Trust me, I've tried it all. My kids don't have any special needs. Given all the resources in the world, e-learning is 100% unsuccessful any way you look at it. I cannot imagine handling e-learning in a home with two working parents and IEPs. 
My point is, the facts remain. Regardless of what your family dynamics are and what your setup is for e-learning, e-learning does not work for anyone. And we are failing our children, ourselves, our families, and our community if we do not make the swift changes needed to put our kids back in school where they belong and where they'll thrive. So let's move forward. Let's move forward, and I'll see you in Patton School soon. Thank you, Stephanie. David, is it Dorkin? Yeah. Dopkin? Oh, excuse me. Good evening. My name is Dr. David Dopkin. I'm a pediatrician here in Arlington Heights, 1430 North Arlington Heights Road, North Arlington Pediatrics, right across the street of Thomas Middle School. I've been a pediatrician in Arlington Heights for over 30 years and have had the distinct pleasure of teaching, uh, not teaching, of uh, being a pediatrician and caring for many of the uh, uh, students and families and uh, the children of a lot of faculty members and uh, been very, very impressed with the outstanding education that District 25 offers uh, uh, the children in my practice. Um, I'm also on the faculty of Northwestern University, Feinberg School of Medicine and the Lurie Children's Hospital where I sit on several committees which have been discussing COVID day in and day out since March and a member of the American Academy of Pediatrics, the largest uh, uh, national pediatric body here, and uh, also the medical advisor for a private school in Skokie, a private high school where my uh, children all attended. Uh, and speaking of my children, I have uh, um, a uh, one daughter is a teacher in a, in a uh, parochial school, two sons-in-laws who are teachers in parochial schools who've been in, in uh, teaching since August, and uh, and I have five, thankfully, five grandchildren who have been attending school, parochial schools since uh, August. All of them have been going, loving school, going every single day, and have uh, not missed any days because of uh, any outbreaks, thankfully. I have one daughter who's a speech therapist for Chicago Public School. She's having the hardest time because so many of her uh, clients have not shown up. They have a hard time, she has to chase them down. She's spending more time just writing reports as you know how to do that, and, uh, and, uh, and is having a lot of frustration. Her full caseload is down to maybe uh, three or four a week. Um, speaking on the uh, science and what's going on, we're here every day, we uh, get the news reports about, or we hear the daily count, and it's, you know, it's very uh, sobering, 1,500, today 2,200 new cases. Um, some deaths spread around the, the state, which is tragic. What's really not reported is the severity of illness. The, uh, right now it's about three and a half, uh, 3.5 or so uh, out of 100 case of, uh, tests are positive. So 97% of people who are being tested are negative. The people who are positive, the vast majority are not ending up in the hospital. This is not how it was in March and April. We were doing so much better. Happy to say, knock on wood, the Lutheran General and Northwest Community, the two biggest hospitals here, have z as of this morning, had zero people on ventilators first time since uh, mid-March. So this is tremendous. You just don't get that report that really, and this has going, been going on for over a month now. The cases are declining, the lowest levels, again, in five, six months, may it all continue like that. It's been wonderful. A lot of the younger people are getting it. I've seen many uh, high schoolers and college kids getting it, unfortunately, but none of them, thankfully, have been very sick. They're all been taken care of at home, town all rest, et cetera. So it's really, there's a lot of cases. We're testing a lot of people. But the severity of illness, thankfully, is, is not there. And that's a lot because we've learned so much over the last six months on how to take care of these people. The vulnerable population, the nursing home, uh, hospital used to get a lot of transmission in nursing homes. In the hospitals, you're not seeing that anymore because everyone's wearing a mask, everyone knows what to do, and that has really helped. So we can't let our guard down just because people aren't ending up in the hospital as much. We still have to wear a mask in public uh, settings. We still have to social distance, use hand sanitizer. All those things have to continue, and we will uh, uh, take care of them. We will get the best of this uh, illness, I believe that. There is, uh, as mentioned already, the uh, whole um, uh, danger of uh, e-learning for five, six hours, but having kids in front of a screen. I've been spending the last 15 years, every um, visit I do, a well checkup I do from age really one and a half on, I'm always preaching that. That's part of all the pediatricians in my practice. One hour screen time a day maximum, or maybe an hour and a half on the weekends, and maybe a little longer, but that's it. I mean, and uh, these kids need to get outside. They need to do things. They need, uh, they really cannot be uh, 
sitting in front of a screen or device, there are proven uh, uh, medical uh, complications or risks with that. One of them being uh, uh, increased BMI, increased uh, weight, obesity. Go is well studied that uh, the longer people are just sedentary sitting in front of a screen, that will increase uh, body weight. It's been a, a proven thing. Myopia, nearsightedness, much more common when people are in front of a screen. And that's why uh, many, and you, some of the longtime educators will see that many, many more uh, kids are now wearing glasses because they're in front of a screen all day long, uh, in, and it's even before this e-learning, they run on a screen watching TV or different things like that. Um, sleep disorders are also well known, uh, well reported in kids who are um, uh, spending too much time in front of a screen. So there's definitely uh, um, some risks. The American Academy of Pediatrics, which I mentioned, has come out strongly. Again, this is the largest body of pediatrician in the, in the country, uh, saying uh, that they, they recommend that children be in school as long as it can be done safely. And we say safely, and that's what uh, the, the schools that I advise, everyone in the building is wearing a mask, staff, faculty, students, there's social distancing within the classrooms, within the hallways, on the school uh, property, there's social distancing, there's sanitizers, there's plexiglass for the teachers, the teachers are sitting at desks. There are ways to do it safely. It's been done, these parochial schools have had tremendous success. There are cases here and there, one or two, They've had, we know in the area that had it, they've identified it, there've been no outbreaks in the Chicago, thankfully, even in nationally. We checked all the blogs and news, there are no outbreaks in, in these schools that have been open because we've identified, you know, you hear, have heard about outbreaks on college campuses, uh, Big Ten schools, et cetera. These are because of uh, teenagers, millennials, college students who are not wearing masks, who are going to parties, who are playing football, whatever. That's where you're getting outbreaks. When it's done properly, when everyone wears a mask, in all public spaces, in schools, you just don't see those outbreaks. I've met with uh, many families over the last uh, uh, month or two, teachers, parents, who are, parents of mine who are teachers, parents, and it is, and I asked them all how things are going. I must say it, it's 95% uh, are upset, they're having a hard time, kids are struggling. My children who, kids who have ADD are struggling the most, but kids, uh, you know, the, par the teachers are not happy, the, the parents are not happy. It's really rare that, you know, occasionally when you have a superstar middle schooler, you know, who's very self-motivated, you'll hear those, they're doing fine, they don't care, they're doing great. That's the, the younger kids especially are suffering a lot. So I do support, as been mentioned here, I support both parents having the choice, both faculty having the choice. I don't believe in hybrid. I think the best thing is for they, them to be in school five days a week. And uh, <laughs> parents, uh, the parents deserve the choice, I feel, it's my opinion. Parents deserve the choice. If they want to send their children, fine. If they want to have e-learning, if they're worried, they should have that choice. Faculty as well. In the school that I advise, five, uh, I think there's uh, five of the teachers have decided to to teach from you know, remote teach and the rest are all in, in school. So the teachers should be given that same choice, not be uh, forced to, but I think both parents and teachers can have that choice and it can be done successfully. I wish you all. Thank you, Dr. Dobkin. All right. Um, oh, I apologize. You're in this pile? Oh, sorry, you got stuck to somebody. Yes, Stephanie, you are in there. <laughs> um, I'm Stephanie Levinsky. I live at 623 North Arlington Heights Road. I have a seventh grader at Thomas Middle School. Last week I was here and my questions were directed towards the board, specifically their motivation for running for school board and why some of you have been consecutive board members. Tonight, I'd like to speak directly to Dr. Bine. Um, we know your motivation for being in Arlington Heights. I mean, you have a yearly compensation of more than $250,000. What I would curious specifically is if you're familiar with who Dr. Aaron Jarrett is. He is the superintendent of Rockford District uh, 203, or 205. Dr. Jarrett is the superintendent of the third largest school district in Illinois. Rockford School District has 42 schools within their district, pre-K through high school, 29,000 students, 
and has more than 4,000 employees. By comparison, Dr. Bine, you are oversee nine schools, 5,500 students, and before last week's layoffs, a staff of 850. While the difference in numbers is a lot, the biggest difference, however, is that Rockford School District has been in school since September 8th. Our school district, however, has had three meetings since September 8th to figure out how to bring students back. We've had 195 days since March 13th, and we still cannot figure out how to get these kids back. Dr. Jarrett fought through the unions, he fought through the opposition, he fought through the people who wanted remote learning. Those, I know you read a letter last night about a parent who was concerned about remote learning and how her child, Dr. Jarrett said, all remote learners will be grouped together across the district and taught by the remote learning teachers. And while it might not be fair, it is equal. Dr. Jarrett found a way to make it happen. So I'm gonna to close tonight because I have said a lot of numbers, but Dr. Bine, I'm gonna ask you to write this number down. 815-966-3101. That's Dr. Jarrett's phone number. I hope you reach out to him and learn from how he got those children back to school. Thank you. All right, let's make sure I didn't miss anyone. And then I have the one submitted online. So yeah, we ha obviously had too many submitted electronically tonight, not obviously, but we did have too many submitted electronically tonight to read any individuals, but Lori has tallied them up by kind of like sentiment here, so we'll just summarize those. They will be taken into the minutes uh, and put on record. So we received 31 um, comments via email today. Um, by 2 o'clock, any additional ones we will add to um, the documented uh, list that the board will see as well as we placed on the website. Um, seven of those um, fall under the category of asking the board to continue remote learning and to not forget remote students if we move to hybrid. Fifteen of those ask the board to implement full in-person learning as soon as possible. One of those um, asked the board to uh, implement a full day kindergarten program in District 25. Five of those asked the board to implement a half day hybrid model. One of those emails uh, asked the board to increase community involvement um, in the process of reentering school. One of those asked how long will hybrid last? And when will full in-person, um, when will that plan be available? Uh, and one asked for an explanation of the hybrid model. classroom in order to get that support services if we change the schedule. And once our transition advisory committee um, determines metrics for a safe return to full in-person learning, this model seriously limits any operational barriers to immediate implementation. Really the only, our busing would be in place, our schedule would be in place, our staffing would be in place all of our services would be in place. The only real thing that would need to happen is we'd need to move a lot more furniture back in to our classrooms. We have that all currently stored in each school. Um, so this model allows for when those metrics are determined and met to really move very immediately into a full, they have a better sense of instructional information to share. 
Again, that lines up with the end of the first trimester for our elementary. Um, so we'd also have reporting information to share at that time. Yeah, we'll try not to schedule a special board meeting on those nights. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. So here's the hybrid structure, uh, very similar to what I explained, but I'll also highlight some of the changes. Um, so moving forward, effective October 12th, Monday would stay an all remote day um, for all of our students. Tuesday and Thursday, so alternating days or skipping a day. Tuesday, Thursday, our students with the last names beginning with A through K would be in person following their typical schedule and their classmates with the last names starting L through Z would be remote with a combination of, of, engage, of live stream and asynchronous work with their classmates. And then Wednesday, Friday, that would flip. So students with the last names AK would be remote, live streaming in um, with asynchronous work and students with last names L through Z would be in person. Now students, I should, uh, something that's uh, different from this Adam, can you look at the next slide? I don't know if, if I put this on here or if I want to back back up. I don't know if I can change and back back up so people can see it. Can you forward one? Uh, yeah, this is good. Thank you. Um, so kind of some exceptions or things to be aware of. Our students, so you know that we have about 200, just over 250 students that have been invited to be in in-person learning since we opened on September 1st. Those students are currently in instructional special education programs throughout the district. They would continue in their current schedule. Um, depending on the program, some of them are here five mornings a week, some are here four mornings a week. Um, there's some individual schedules. The staff uh, that works with those students feel that it would be best for their continuity to continue in the schedules they're currently in. Again, we change the days of week um, for our letters, so instead of a group of kids being here Tuesday, Wednesday, and then the next group coming Thursday, Friday, the staff wanted to stagger those so they could on Tuesday say, okay guys, when you're home tomorrow, remember, you're gonna come in at this time, we're gonna do this together, we're gonna work on this, um, and then they could see those kids um, kind of more frequently um, than spacing them out two days and two days and not seeing them for a whole nother week. Um, we, um, again, you'll, we'll change the middle school Monday to what we call their condensed or assembly schedule um, so that students are really focused on asynchronous work after two o'clock on Mondays. And we're working on balance. We have many examples, but they need to do some individualizing at the school. Um, on the elementary school Monday schedule, again, trying to address that screen time with kids. Um, we came out of the gate at 150 miles per hour to try to do exceptional work and we all realize for our teachers and our students, we need to find a balance now of that live Zoom interaction and that asynchronous time. So they have um, suggested schedules to help create that experience, especially on Mondays. Again, it gives our teachers some collaboration time as well um, to best implement the hybrid model for each week. And again, we're increasing asynchronous experiences throughout the week um, whenever possible. Uh, asynchronous work tied to the instruction that's occurring, um, but giving all of our staff and students um, some break from that screen time. Uh, next slide, please, I think. Oh yeah, again, um, this model has challenges. And every model has challenges, but as we've heard tonight, um, it's time to move forward and we'll keep working on the challenges as we move forward. If we wait to solve every challenge and every piece, we'll be waiting a lot longer. So um, we're ready to move forward and, and still work through some of those challenges uh, that will present ourselves. Every change has challenge, so it makes people nervous. Um, but as we asked our staff and our committees, everybody's interested in, in moving forward and seeing our students. We're gonna focus on the benefits of in-person learning. We all agree that being in person, face-to-face, -face, kids to friends and teachers to students is extremely powerful and even more powerful than the challenges that any model will present. Uh, just a reminder to the board, in August, what we heard 
so many times from families was worry that we'd only be doing two and a half hours of synchronous learning. Lots of emails, lots of calls, lots of comments at that July board meeting about we should be having a longer school day. Two and a half hours of live interaction is not enough. Um, we've overcome that and we've overcome it to the far extreme, right? So that's where the balance uh, is, is important now. One of the October concerns that we'll have now is the fidelity of a hybrid program. Can we implement it and sustain it? It's a new way of working, just like remote learning was. It's a new way of working. It's going to be difficult as we get going. Can we sustain that on behalf of our teachers especially? And we have concerns, uh, we'll hear concerns about can we engage our remote students as well as our in-person students? Um, and we're really, um, really believe we can. We have worked with schools that have been doing this exact model for four to five weeks. Um, we've been in their classrooms, we've talked to their teachers, we know the challenges that they met and how they overcame them. So we feel very confident that we can implement this um, and keep all of our students engaged. Um, one of the concerns we heard tonight and we've, we've all had is that uh, we're starting this transition later than we had hoped. Um, however, again, if you look at the dates that we've compacted um, the, the groups to bring back, we'll have all of our grades transitioning within our projected dates and even earlier than we could have been going by the original schedule that kept each of our groups uh, transitioning 10 days apart. The Transition Advisory Committee and the other two committees each talked about that. Can't we, com can't we compress the amount of days in between groups or bring more groups back at a time so that we can all get back to some in-person learning sooner? And this model does do that. Next slide, please. Um, some reminders, um, and you'll hear every superintendent say this because it's real. Our situation is fluid. Um, we do have good data on the amount of COVID cases here in Arlington Heights. That is accessible on our website that people can follow on a daily basis. The doctor shared his experience. Um, we also have data about the um, probable and the positive cases here within District 25 among our staff and among our students who have been on site uh, for short-term activities or for instruction since September 1st. We have that data showing how many positive cases we have. We have a trend that's really interesting to see that when we started tracking this in August, we had significant amount of close contact numbers, significant amount of people we had to quarantine. And we've gotten great at that now. It was a great result for us to bring staff here first so they could get used to the procedures and the safety plans. Because now when we have positive or possible cases, we do not have numerous people, so we have to quarantine. We have that individual case that has to quarantine. So that data has been really powerful for us to see. We have not had a positive case on site in District 25 um, since mid-August. Um, so again, our goal remains to move to full in-person learning. We all agree nothing is as good as our typical in-person model. That continues to be our goal. A reminder to all of us, staff, parents, our children, the expectations and rules of this year are new. They're different. This is not going to look exactly like previous years. We're not going to be in the same place in the curriculum in December as we are in a typical December. We all need to be flexible. People have requests, uh, staff members have requests, and our mission at the district office is to be creative and to help meet those so that we can help our staff continue to be here and do the work that they want to do and be safe while doing that. And several people mentioned at the last several meetings and tonight, uh, everyone's giving 150%. Our teachers have been incredible. Our students and our families, what we have to do as parents to support our own children in remote learning is something none of us ever could have realized. But we rise to that occasion and we make it work. And I know that everyone will continue to give 150%. To be honest with you as a superintendent, one of my goals is to help people back off a little bit 
right? And to let them slow down and take a breath and know that we're already doing amazing. We don't have to stay at high speed and high energy level every day. We've got to find a balance and that will be awesome. And that the power of being together in person outweighs anything we might slow down on, outweighs any challenge that we might have ahead of us. I don't know if I have another slide or if that's it. That's it. So again, we, that is the model that we have with um, our, uh, especially our remote learning committee and our teachers association committee determined that we believe is in the best interest of um, keeping our students in a consistent uh, service uh, delivery model and the model that we believe helps us move to in full person learning uh, as fluidly than as any model could. Happy to take questions from the board. All right, thank you, Lori. I know we, uh, we all have had questions throughout uh, that we have asked of uh, that we have asked the Lori and her staff. Um, some of them, some of us want to probably highlight some of those for the benefit of the audience here, the audience online, as well as those at, that we've been responding to uh, electronically. I know Lori has answered thousands of emails with much care and uh, not only answering them, but taking um, positive comments like some of the ones we heard tonight into the plans. Um, obviously, they all can't be accommodated. Um, as we said, there is no perfect plan, um, but the goal is and always has been uh, to try to get back to as close as normal as possible, if normal is ever going to be a thing again. Uh, I hope to be at a Cubs game pretty soon, but you never know. Right? So um, who wants to start? I know we all had some. Aaron, go ahead. Lori, I, um, I want to ask you about the two-day full day and how that's going to work with students at home and students at school and how the teachers will be able to engage that those two groups simultaneously thank you good question so in general um if i am a teacher i have 10 children probably or 10 students in front of me and i have my other 10 students on my gallery zoom is one way to do it um, also in a, we've got um, some tech abilities to have it, so all of these kids are facing me. Um, and I'm um, teaching a whole group lesson to get started. Um, and we have broken down for teachers sample um, kind of lesson plans for every subject. So for whatever subject it is, I'm starting with my whole class and I'm presenting information. We might be doing some discussion and I'm saying friends in class, who else has a question about that? my friends on Zoom who wants to chime in and share on that. And then I might be saying, um, okay guys, it's time to do X, Y, Z activity. My friends on Zoom now, you're gonna work on this piece. We're gonna log off or turn you off for a bit. You're gonna work on that. Uh, my friends here, you're gonna work on this activity at your seat and, um, or we're gonna have a question answer and then maybe a little bit later we're going to switch now this group let's do our question answer you guys are going to work on this part it really is in very many ways like having two small groups in your class at various times throughout the lesson um, i might be able to say to my friends on zoom okay guys you guys are going to read now this book or these pages or work on your spelling or what have you and then we're going to do something a little bit different in here and when the days switch then you guys are working on your spelling during this time and work, we're working on another, the same interactive activity that group did on the day that they were here. Um, so again, we have it um, broken down um, for every subject. Um, there'll be some things like PE or music or art, and it might be a day where we can all stay on and we're all working on the same thing. Um, and it might be a day where I get us started. You guys go outside for a half hour and you're gonna practice this outside and then I'm gonna take my in-person kids outside on that day. And then we'll again switch for the next PE. There's also been models, um, actually our transition advisory committee parents had some great ideas too um, on how you can kind of expand on that. So it could be, um, Aaron, you're online today and I'm your buddy. And so you're on, uh, you're on my laptop or on my Chromebook sitting next to me facing the teacher 
And at a time, a teacher might say, turn and do this with your buddy. And I'll be like, Aaron, blah, 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 blah. And then I turn you back so you can see the teacher. So there's a variety of ways, but in general, it's like teaching two groups. It's not easy, right? It's not always perfect. Um, we originally gave a plan to our teachers that kind of had our kids when they were home being observers. And our teachers, um, of course, I'm so proud of them and I'm not surprised. We're like, but we don't want them to just be observers. We want them engaging. And I want to be able to engage with them as well as the kids that are in front of me. And I want them to engage with each other. So depending on the activity that they're doing, um, that will alternate throughout the subject. Same kind of thing we talked about middle school science with the teacher. And he will start the lesson with both groups. And then he might have his Zoom um, kids working on some Okay, thank you, Adam. Okay, so just sorry for the audience here. Did I, we are returning to the live stream now. Okay, I'll repeat um, what I just said. So, you know, we're going to be moving forward with transparency with one goal, right? Safely getting our students to return to school full time. But, and in understanding that as we try to get to this high, you know, work through hybrid and then full time, if, that, if that's the way you've decided to go. Um, in doing the feasibility studies, what made you pick and the team pick this model versus the AMPM model? Thank you. Um, yeah, we have definitely developed plans for both and several other types of models along the way. Um, and kind of like I shared earlier, when it came down to um, what is the best of imperfect models for our students, um, we really looked at the principles um, that we felt were really important. That is, again, our students with EL and IEP resources being able to maintain their schedule and not upending their experience um, for them so they could also stay with the staff members they were working with as opposed to moving to a model where they had to have a whole new schedule, new staff members, and then we come to in full in person and that has to change again for them. Um, continuing our typical schedule for stu that students have been experiencing um, in remote learning so they could experience all of those subjects. And then again, um, with that, that this model really allows for a fluid transition to full in person. Uh, we don't have to change schedules again. We don't have to reorganize anything. It's just moving to five days a week. Um, and again, that this model allowed us um, much more throughout our population for kids to keep their um, current teacher. And we knew that with this model, um, as soon as we know those transition metrics, um, there's really no operational barrier in, way, in the way except to move all of our furniture back in. So this model really provided the most fluid movement from remote to hybrid, and again, a more quickly fluid movement to full in person. I will say that the, the, all of these were important. Um, there are great positives of AM, PM as well, no doubt about it. Um, I would say the, um, the one that really, the committee really went, wow, I, I, I really feel like we can't put our kids who need so resource support in academics um, and behavior and emotional supports in a situation where they have to completely rechange their schedule and then change it again a third time. So kind of keeping with that, can you talk a little bit about how this model is going to impact our goal to move to full in-person instruction? Yeah, I think uh, a few people might have brought it up tonight. So the Transition Advisory Committee, you've all probably seen 
the great work they did with determining metrics um, for our district to, to consider to move into hybrid. Um, and when we la left our last meeting um, last week, the group said, um, Lori, when we come back, we want to we want to really get in place what metrics help us move to in you know full person, and we want to have that in place. Um, we want to communicate it quickly um, so that when we hit those agreed upon metrics, that we can move more quickly um, and and not hit the operational barriers that uh, otherwise could come up. So that committee of parents and staff and board members is very committed to. Um, determining those metrics. Um, uh, we all hope that we will do it in one meeting, but um, it took us two meetings to determine the original metrics, but um, so that their goal and their interest is very strong in getting those metrics in place. And again, with this model of a uh, hybrid uh, instruction, um, again, the only operational barrier that's really in front of us is getting the furniture moved. All right. You ready? Rich. Um, no, no. Uh, first off, thank you, Lori, for responding to the questions that uh, we had. I'd ask that uh, in the interest of time, these somehow get posted out um, for the general public, unless you want me to go through every question. No, all of this will be put in the public okay. section of board docs. All right. Um, one of the main, yeah, I hope also in here a lot of comments talked about the, um, yeah, I think more information needs to be into the hybrid, this brochure, and I know you guys said it's draft, got it, um, to really let the parents know, the, you know how the coursework is going to be done as you've defined it within the questions so that they are making an informed decision on hybrid or, re or remote. And there's a couple points. Um, just to, I think, maybe just to walk through an example, especially with the other, you know, what, you, what we talked about, um, you know, what would be used if uh, someone has COVID or has, is systematic. So if I look at this, just so, you know, we're clear, kind of, this is what Lori provided. Um, if a student um, becomes systematic, which could be anything from symptomatic, symptomatic, symptomatic sorry, symptomatic, um, which could be anything from they, you know, their stomach is not feeling well while they're in school, right? There's a whole list that according to these guidelines here that that child may be out for 10 days. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, so the list, the one that you have is the most uh, updated version as of September 10th. And what you can't really notice unless you really look for why there's a difference from the one in late August to September 10th is asterisk number two on this chart, which um, then applies to all of those symptoms of, you're right, before this version came out, Rich, you're exactly right. If someone sneezed, if someone coughed, I have a headache, my stomach hurts, we were gonna need to send them home until they could have a negative COVID test or an alternate diagnosis by a doctor. So that a doctor would write a note saying, I've evaluated this student, he has allergies, or I've evaluated Lori, she's stressed and her stomach hurts, or what have you. With this updated one, that asterisk for footnote number two, talks about if this is a new symptom. So that means if I go to the nurse and I um, have a headache, but my mom can tell the nurse, yeah, Lori gets migraines and here's how they happen and here's how the symptoms show. And the nurse can go, okay, then this isn't a brand new type of symptom for Lori and I don't have to be excluded. Or Lori, um, yeah, she gets seasonal allergies. Yep, I've seen that, I have that documented. We've talked to her and her family about that before. I don't have to exclude her. That small little footnote has a huge impact, right? earlier or up until this came out uh, September 10th, when we had staff members or students that had a symptom, we were sending them home. So this has a huge impact on that. Along with this, the second page that's really for our nurses, it really spells out for the nurses. So how do you determine if this is a symptom that's still safe for a child to be in school? It has really pretty prescriptive questions that they check 
things they, so a nurse doesn't feel like, a nurse feels confident that the decision I would make as a nurse at Patton is the same decision the nurse at Thomas would make. Um, so that's huge because you're right, otherwise we would be often, very often excluding many, many people for 14 days unless they had a negative COVID test or an alternate diagnosis from a doctor. Um, in looking at the plan, uh, this is a plan you came up with back in August um, that's available on our website. And looking at the current hybrid plan, um, the vast majority is exactly the same. So back in August, you mentioned that once the TAC came up with the metrics, we'd have two weeks or within 10 days, we'd be back. Um, at the last session, you said up, oh, they, they asked for an additional time. And so I'm just trying to walk through the timeline of how did, how did we come up with October 12th if 90% of what you're now publishing is the same that we knew in August? What, what changed? What, what do we know? And I know earlier you said the teachers wanted more time, but that would have been incorporated in that 10-day period anyway. So what changed? Yeah, I, I, I would say that the teachers um, deserved more time. Um, as we, as you, we mentioned before, we presented a hybrid model to our um, remote learning committee, um, very similar to this, um, but with more of a broad framework, um, more of a here's how, um, here's how an instructional day can happen, and we gave them two alternatives, or you could do it this way or that way. And they spoke at that time that they really wanted one um, hybrid model with, with great detail. So kind of like the kind of a lesson plan for my schedule. How exactly do I break up my math time to serve both of these groups? What type of asynchronous activities can you provide me as resources? so that when I am having one group doing asynchronous, whether they're in my class or on Zoom, can you give me um, a variety of resources I can choose from? Can you show me how that looks? How does asynchronous happen? So they really wanted much more detail, um, which we then did go back and provide them. Um, again, on both how, does my, how do I schedule my lessons and what is asynchronous? Give me give me actual examples of asynchronous work that could be happening with either of these groups. So that was part of the more time. In addition to that um, was, um, yeah, we've been all working so hard, our students and us to get remote learning the best we can. We need a little more time to pivot and be ready to prepare our students and ourselves to plan for a model while we're working in one model and then to move to that model. So really the difference, um, Rich, in addition to, to time, was um, their request, very legitimate request for us to really kind of detail it out. Typically in District 25, we have such skilled and artful teachers. Um, they take general information and they make it their own. In this situation, they said, can you please be a little more prescriptive for us? And when we're all feeling really comfortable, then let us make it our own and make alterations. Opposed to what I had presented to them was a broader, now take this and make it your own. They really wanted something kind of that they could more um, directly follow um, initially until um, they and their students had made the transition and then they can expand on it individually. Go ahead. Uh, Rich, can I ask a follow-up question yeah, yeah. to yours? Um, so in rolling out this hybrid plan, the two-day plan, um, how are you, uh, how is this implementation process going to work with the teachers? It, it seems like from uh, comments that we've heard today and we got some, uh, an email even from a teacher in the district. Um, so how, as far as being a little, it sounds like she was a little unclear as to the path forward. So how are you rolling out this plan and getting the teachers on board and the professional development that takes to get them to do this? Yeah, good question. So um, teachers were, we shared uh, very similar information with all staff tomorrow to let them know that this is what we would be moving forward with. Um, again, through the remote learning committee, which again has teacher representatives representing every type of grade and every type of teaching 
position in the district. Um, it was through that um, committee that we determined we needed two remote learning planning days like we had at the beginning of the year to do professional development and to give teachers really time to collaborate and get their individual week set up. We did that at the beginning of the year for remote and they want to put these two dates in place now so that uh, we do have professional development all ready to go. Uh, much of it is similar to what we provided at the beginning of the year and teachers had kind of a selection, a menu of items for what do I most need to learn more about, what do I want to experience more. So we have a huge selection of them to use, but even as important built into those two days is plenty of time for them to determine what are my grade level team members and I want to do to make sure we're up and running, and then what do I individually want to have ready to go? So a lot of time built into those two days as well as PD for the areas that they want to choose to explore more. So, Chad, did you have a question? Oh, you yeah. want to go back and forth? You want to keep just... Oh, that's fine. Go ahead, Chad. Mix it up. All right. So I guess my, one of my questions really is around, I know this plan is around, uh, being on the transition committee, it's around a six foot social distancing to start with, correct? And I understand from our enrollment from last week, we average K through eight fifth is a 20.9 per student average, right? That's an average. So based on this model initially, we're going with a six foot. And I just wanna make sure that I, I'm understanding this and everybody in the community, it's a six foot social distancing initially. The transition committee will then go through the next piece and when we go back to full, because really my intention is to go back to full. And at some point in time, if they say, we meet all these necessary requirements, then technically that social distancing would go from six feet down to potentially four, three, or whatever it is to meet this five foot in person. And I just, listen, I want my kids in school. I think everybody does, but I think the reality is I just making sure that everybody understands what they're signing up for when suddenly we make that transition because there are people who don't and that's why we want six, non six foot. I just want to make sure that's a clear understanding. Yeah, thank you. So you're right. This hybrid model basically brings at the most half of our students back to school at a time because some can choose to stay full remote. With half of our students, we can have six foot distancing in all of our learning spaces. Um, in all of our classrooms, we've done a measurement in every room um, throughout the district. The, the greatest average is 12 students in a room, can be, kept, can be six foot apart from each other and from the adult. That's with us removing some of the like group tables or some of that other furniture that was in there. We have some classrooms that are as low as 10, some classrooms that can fit 14. Um, so this model maintains six foot distancing in all instructional um, spaces. Um, and as, as the Transition Advisory Committee determines what metrics from the Illinois Department of Public Health or the CDC or what have you, as they determine what metrics they feel um, we should utilize to look to full in-person learning, um, we'll, there'll also be parts of that uh, where we'll have to detail for families. Um, if we use X criteria, that aligns with the Illinois Department of Public Health or the Northern Illinois Public Health Consortium um, and uh, which at that point would say we no longer needed six foot distancing or they will also have to detail we believe at this date and this time we would recommend we don't stick with six foot distancing and we offer this opportunity that's five foot or four foot or three foot right some of our um, districts that have gone back full in person with the remote learning choice. Some of those are maintaining six foot distancing in those situations, some are not. They're saying we're gonna do three and a half foot um, and, and that's just, we're just gonna communicate that. So, so that committee will, yeah, this model keeps six foot distancing in all of those environments. If we're going to change that six foot distancing to move forward, we definitely would have to make sure people are aware of that. Some people might make different choices, both on behalf of their students and, and for staff as well. Let's go back to Rich. Yeah, so um, just going back to the timeline then of understanding the process here. So if we were to, 
back again in August, you said we needed 10 days. So is it now still 10 days or is it different? So if the tax says 10 days, you know, we, we met the metrics, then do we anticipate 10 days and we're back in operation? Yeah, no, it's, um, so the guidance from the Illinois, Northern Illinois uh, Consortium of Public Health Departments, I guess, um, recommends that moving between one instructional model to another that you should exist in that model for at least 10 days before moving to the next. So if our metrics are X and we're in remote, we should watch those metrics stay X for 10 days before we move to hybrid. If we're in hybrid and we see the metrics go to Y, we should uh, be able to stay in hybrid for 10 days before we move to full. Originally in our plan, we utilized that to space out the groups of students that we had coming. So we said originally, we'll do these three grades, we'll put them in for 10 days. We'll see if the metrics stay and the operational side of things continue, then we'd bring the next group. It was kind of using that model and expanding, that model from the health consortium and expanding it. In reality, uh, the tech committee and the staff committees as well, um, both agreed that as we move our start date to October 12th, we can lessen that 10 day period in between groups because we're really not talking about changing models. We're just talking about bringing more groups into a model. So we agreed that we would lessen that. So the same thing would happen moving to full in person. Once those metrics are met, we could in theory move to that model the very next day. Um, the way our metrics are set up. There are some districts around us that you will see part of their metrics published include when we hit metric A, we must see metric A continue for 10 days before we do this. This committee has not chosen that at this point. Um, so we would, if we hit, like we did this time, they determined the metrics and we hit them we could, as soon as all our operational pieces are in place, move forward. That will happen much easier moving to in-person, so we won't have a waiting period, I guess, is the easy way to say it. When we hit that metric, we can transition. All right, so then maybe said differently or, or just playing with that uh, thought there, that if the, that TAC committee meets next week, which is the 28th, 29th, and they establish metrics, which we'd met, there'd be no operational barrier to then being full on the 12th, let's say. Yeah, as soon as we could move furniture, that is correct. Now, I will so tell you, let's- Can I just clarify, so we do still need to have a meeting with the Teachers Association because there are guidelines that we have to follow in order to meet contract requirements with them? Thank you, what Stacy's referring to is the Transition Advisory Committee says, here's the metric and we met it. If our teachers association still feels that that's an, un if they feel but that's an unsafe working condition, we have to agree with them on, um, it's not an unfair working condition or an unsafe working condition um, to move forward. Um, the other thing I was going to say, oh, so in reality of our metrics, right? Um, I don't have them exactly in front of me, but there's something like um, we use, the committee uses Region 10, which is suburban Cook County, and the percent positivity rate. So let's say that's 4% or 6, it was 6% at the time. They're looking for under 8%, so that's good. Our local positive cases per 100,000, so that's in zip code 6004, 6005. The metric the committee established to move to hybrid is basically under 175 out of 100,000. Currently, that number is somewhere around 60, um, fluctuating around there. So the, the health consortiums um, and the numbers that they recommend for kind of back to normal is like seven out of 100,000. Now, this committee did not go with the, with the most strict numbers recommended by Department of Public Health, Health Consortium, or anything for our metrics. But I just want you to be aware, um, there's, there's still gonna be some metric and it's not gonna be, I, I would be shocked if they're like, when we get to 55, let's go, right? So there's still, 
um, really going to have to do a job of a good job of what's the science behind uh, moving to in to full in person. What's the metric that all of the health consortiums and us locally feel is appropriate? But in theory, if they determined it's X and we meet X, we make sure we're not violating a working condition and we move forward. Okay. Then again, going with that kind of theme, at what point, let's say the, because we've placed a lot of onus onto these committees, or realistically the TAC, right? And we've taken and provided a lot of of, uh, I don't want to call it power, it's not that, but just a lot of input onto there because that's what they're providing. They're providing recommendations. They're not, they're not making a decision. They're providing a recommendation that they feel the community can support. So at what point do we step in and say, you know what, this committee has been at it for three weeks, three months, and cannot come up with a decision for coming back to and saying, you know, what we need as a, uh, a board, as something to say, we need to make an alternative decision. Yeah, that's something the board could have conversations on at any time. That is not okay. that is not the what we're seeing from that committee um, at all right now. Um, but at any time, the board could say, "Hey, we need to talk about are these committees functioning in the way that we believe they should to represent their community." Okay, so maybe. Oh, go ahead, Shane. Because I'm on the committee, so yeah. I'll just address that. Um, I think the committee has been really good. I mean, they were quick to realize, like the 175, they were very clear, like, listen. That seems plenty, right? So I think the reality of it is that you have a variety of teachers, parents who are all have the best interest. I don't see them, they wanted the kids all back in school. Let's just be, you know, and we're all out there saying the thing. I think it's just having the right people come to the right decision and saying, okay, everybody's comfortable and we need to move this forward, right? I think that was the key. And I think they were comfortable with 175. I think they saw seven was way too, if you do seven and you do per 100,000, that means we have one case in Arlington Heights every day for a week. That's not gonna, and the reality is that's not gonna happen in the stupid mask, sorry. Um, but, so I think they've got that number. I think now we just have to figure out, okay, and I think I wanna make sure I'm very clear though, this five day in person means that everybody who wanted to come back is back. So technically we're gonna be in a hybrid model, meaning I just, so to speak, people are gonna be remote still, and people are still gonna be, remote if they choose to be remote they're not going to be back in the school so i think th i just want to make sure i'm understanding that because that's a clear thing that we like we talk about five day back those are the people who have chosen they've made the decision they want to be back in but if parents do not want to come back this is going to be continued down the same process potentially right it's not hey we're five day back and you just chose not to come back you you got you kind of come back right i just want to make sure i'm understanding that because yeah right right now the law requires that families have the choice for remote learning um, I think it was in July, uh, the law required that schools could provide the option, it got changed. So at this point, um, under the, what a phase four in the state of Illinois, um, yes, if we decide we're gonna go to five full day um, in-person learning, families who wanna choose remote, full remote could continue to do that. Yeah, I just gonna say, Rachel. I think I think I'm confident that the committee's going to have the best interest of everybody involved. I, you know, I think they really were quick within two. I know it was two meetings, but the reality is the first one was just getting to right. the initial. I think this one will be quick. I think the reality is, you know, as Lori said, we got to get the first group in, get the second group in, and, and you know, I I can see the committee saying we want to be live by November first or even before that. But I don't I don't think this is going to drag out. I mean, I. I don't see that happening. Now that, that committee is a, is a really good cross section of you know very committed individuals and healthcare professionals and teachers and principals and many people that share the views of folks in this room and, and so I don't think we're going to run into a timeline issue. So it's been. Oh, I, I don't. I just want to make sure that we, yeah, no. we kind of work through all the bases here and have nope. a complete nope. understanding. I'm with you. You know, just on that. Conversely, too, is is if the tech comes back and says. We want to go, come back in two weeks. The board can look at that and say, we don't feel it's, it's appropriate at this time. Yeah, again, so, that board makes recommendations to the superintendent who, in consultation with the board, makes the final decision. Yep. Wait, They're so a recommending body, basically. The committee is? Yes, the committee. Right, so then the board can make the final decision. Yes. Okay. 
I think, I think you had a comment. I, I just want, can we double check if Scott had a question? Oh. Well, can you guys hear us related to this, though? Yeah, I, I was going to say the same oh. thing I was going to say before I jump in. I was wondering if Scott wanted to say something. <laughs> yes. Can you guys hear me? Yes yep. or no? Yep. Yes. Okay. All right. Because I've been trying to jump in. I'm sorry. Um, I just, uh, I want to jump back to the, the conversation that Rich and Anishka were having. Um, based on the professional development that we're going to be voting on on the next uh, agenda item, uh, it's somewhat contradictory where um, the the teachers didn't exactly know what they what they wanted to, to they needed more guidance but then those days are going to be you said you're you're going to they're going to be allowed to pick what they want to uh, pick and choose what they want to learn from it sounds like there needs to be more um, guidance on on those days is 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 that going to be pushed through where, where this is this is the way it's going to be that's that's my concern is um is that because right now it's it's what i what is it that i don't know at this point yeah thank you good uh question so it's it's a i guess i would say it this way it's kind of a, a selection of professional development experiences kind of like if you'd say i need zoom 101 or i need zoom 102 or i need um you know i need to know how to uh, work my technology so that um, I can engage my students more. There's a variety. There's classes on or workshops um, that have been created that teachers have been a part of on how do I how do I implement asynchronous learning related to social studies and history or what have you. So we basically have a time where here's the time of the day that you could select from these items that again we created we put that structure in of these are the topics that you need to be make sure you're exposed and experienced in but also again equally important in there is building time for me as a teacher to collaborate with my grade level peers and make sure we're all um, kind of providing a, a similar experience for our students across the grade level and build in some time for me to make sure I've done all that I want to do now that I'm moving to this step to prepare my classroom for students to come in. So, yeah, sorry if I described it. It's, it's not as loose as it, it may have sounded. There is a, um, a menu that we've created that ties directly to these are the skills and the, and the strategies you need to be, util, be able to utilize in this two-day, three-day model. And if there's something here that you haven't uh, felt you've had enough experience with, you can visit that professional development, um, again, balanced with time to collaborate with their peers. All right. Um, so if, like Rich said, we were, we were to go back and, you know, all the committees said, yes, let's go back tomorrow, the, the one operational barrier that we're, we're kind of facing right now that Stacy said is that unsafe working environment is that that's like the last hurdle that we we'd have to overcome is that correct yeah really that's it is making sure that the the teachers association feels that we're not violating the working conditions in the contract if they did and, I, and again I'll state this we've said it before but um, we have an incredibly collaborative relationship between the board administration and the teacher association here in Arlington Heights. Um, it's not like when you hear the teachers union in, in, on the news, it's a very different relationship. But on behalf of their members, if they felt we were recommending coming back and they felt it was unsafe for their staff to do that, we would have to have conversations about that. And to the extreme level, I, well, I guess I would say for us extreme, um, enter into negotiations, a formal negotiations process. Many school districts are engaged in that process right now. Um, and it goes, you know, it, all of them try to make it go quickly to get to resolution. Um, but that could be kind of the, the far end of things is if they really felt, of course, we want to come back with our kids full time, but it is not safe for our members to do that, then we would go through um, a negotiation process on that topic. Keeping in mind, we've been at the table, so to speak, with them throughout this entire process too, so, right? 
Uh, that's Hi, definitely been one of the benefits of, of them being one of those three committee groups is we've definitely been having these conversations all along. Okay. And that's, yeah, I just, you mentioned the furniture. I just don't want something down the road to, to kind of pop up. Yeah, thank you. No, you and me are moving furniture, Scott. That's fine. I'll, I'll help you out, Brian. <laughs> all right. Anisha, did you have a related question or a new question? Doesn't matter, but I want to give you a minute. Oh, I got it. Thank you. My, my fingers are slipping. Um, so, Lori, have you heard from the teachers as far as um, concerns with this hybrid plan? And I, as a former teacher myself, and, and this is a new year, and they're, they're challenging themselves, and they're pushing themselves, and we know they're working at 150 degrees. But um, the concern of, the teacher concerns of how do you manage students in the classroom and students at home? And then secondly, the, the parent concern and community concern, and I'm a, I'm a mom myself, is this increased um, screen time concern. So will the students that are in class, while the teacher is trying to meet the needs of the students on, uh, at home, will they be on screens? And does that then defeat the purpose of them being in school? Yeah, good question. Yes, are there teachers that have concerns moving forward with this model? There absolutely are. Are there teachers that are confident and can't, ready, can't wait to get started with this model? Yes, there are, right? Just like in the community, there are different um, opinions, different comfort levels that exist among staff as well. Again, by having that remote learning committee representing all grades, music, PE, uh, middle school, elementary, um, their role was, and, and was to represent the different um, perspectives of their colleagues, as does the union leadership have to represent their 460 members, um, knowing that those members can have um, different levels of comfort, different interests in models, et cetera. So again, we felt that very strongly um, those two staff committees said, let's go, let's move forward with this model. Um, and, but there are also people on, that, um, on the remote learning committee that were saying, I'm not happy with this, right? So, um, so now we know we move forward and we work on that challenge of how do I manage, right? How do I do classroom management for students who are in front of me and students who um, are on Zoom or Google Classroom or whatever it may be. So that's one of those challenges we'll continue to work on. From a screen time perspective, no, no. In general, students in the classroom are not, we're not gonna be just Zooming in the classroom, right? We're not just taking the experiencing and moving it into the classroom. Will there be times though that maybe the assessment I made is digital, so let's all do it, take it digitally? Yes. Will there be some teachers who, as they transition, say, I want to start it first, like having all my kids on, so we, and then start to go away from it because I'm more comfortable starting in the process we've all been in together and then transitioning away together? We will have some of that. We will strongly encourage our teachers to transition in the way that they feel most comfortable for them and for their students. But part of the benefit of moving in person is decreasing screen time when I'm in person and also, uh, as we talked about on the Monday and throughout the week, increasing meaningful asynchronous working, uh, in asynchronous work so that we can all do some things off of our screen time, whether we're in person or at home. More questions. Um, just going back to the union conversation here, I just want to be clear then because stacy was talking about that we have to inform them and no we don't have to inform them no as Lori said we have to um have their agreement that um they don't uh, they have the right to demand a bargain working conditions so if the working conditions change then we have to meet with them and get their agreement because they have the right to demand to bargain it. So that's, so a, that's a legal process we have to go through. So if we know we intend to go 
at some point in the near term, hopefully, to full time? Have we already started those discussions with the union so that we're in front of it, so that we're not using that as an operational barrier and that they are already prepared for or we've worked through the issues or whatever that may be? Yeah, and to give you an example, so many districts have uh, bargained every step till now. Uh, we've had ongoing um, meetings with our union and anything that we've has come in question, we've agreed to do a memorandum of understanding. We've, we've come to compromises, that comes in writing, that's being put together and will be presented to the board. So we've really been in an, a great situation. We haven't, we didn't have to go stop and negotiate, you know, months ago along the way. Are we starting to talk about, okay, you know, we're gonna move to in full person learning and that's gonna require a lessening of that six feet. We have touched on those conversations and as the transition advisory committee makes their determination hopefully on tuesday that's our formal okay are we ready to to do this or do we need to go to negotiations over it so, so yes we have talked about it all along the way um, at this point maintaining that six feet is something that's a strong interest on behalf of our staff um, and so that that's why while we moving forward we will continue to dialogue, but the possibility exists that dialogue could have to fall under a negotiation framework to make a quick movement if we're unable to agree. Okay. Um, looking at the, just understanding the technology. So um, do you have all the technology that you need? Um, I'm, I'm fortunate to teach in a graduate type of setting as well, and we have a, we're in a hybrid model. You have in school and remote, but the technology is phenomenal. We have way more than anything we have here. So I wanna make sure that the teachers have the right technology. Cause I remember last board meeting you said, oh, they, we had to buy additional monitors and we saw pictures where teachers were at their desk, they had two monitors. So how's that gonna work in a hybrid model with, are they have to monitor the kids here or do we have other screens available? How will that work? Was Chris, I was gonna ask a technology question too. Chris, are you out there? Chris Fano, are you? interested Calling in Chris. giving an answer of what kind of technology we have, what capacity we have, and what kind of technology we have that could support teachers in this hybrid model. Sure, good evening. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. So just talking a little bit about classroom equipment, obviously we do have the monitors that we've added this year. Uh, we've increased bandwidth um, to make sure we're able to handle uh, increased internet capacity, both with our staff now in remote as well as anticipating the needs for hybrid. Uh, we have models now where we're gonna get microphones for the rooms that need it. Um, we also have additional uh, access points and areas that we know will we're, we'll have high density for certain kids or for certain areas to again handle traffic. We're also gonna survey the staff and say, how, depending on how they're setting up their classroom, what other additional needs may they have? So it could be an extra set of external speakers for the class could be like a puck microphone so that all the kids can hear or you know the kids in the classroom can speak in and then the kids at home can hear them um, and then the other part we're going to do is model some setup so that again they may want to have something displayed on their projector so we have a webcam that will be able to see both the teacher and the content on the projector um, so we're working out some of the details but we do have again some of the things already purchased and deployed for staff and then we have um, actually orders coming in right now for microphones, uh, for speakers, and then if we do need additional screens, we have those budgeted for as well. So it is gonna be a fluid in some degree. Teachers are gonna have you know, their pre preferred method of how they're instructing, depending on grade level, subject area, class configuration. Uh, so again, but we do recognize that bandwidth, video, audio, and then the interactivity between those pieces. So I'm a teacher, kids at home have to hear me, kids in the room have to hear me. Kids participating need to be able to be heard by those at home as well. And then we just have to work on the proximity of the teacher. So keeping them in a webcam view or that they're able to change the camera uh, so that they can move around and the kids at home would still be able to see them. So a lot of variables, uh, but we will have the equipment available to them uh, some of it will be based on their personal preference and their configuration, and then we'll have some, um, you know, that will be baseline for everybody. I also didn't mention too, we're, we're looking at another category, it's just document cameras and iPads as a second screen. 
I'm going to put you on a spot with this question that just hit me. Any learnings or anything you've found from what's been going on with the in-person instruction at Windsor thus far? Can you just repeat that one more time? The instruction that's been going on at Windsor thus far, any, anything unique coming out of there from a technology perspective? So in-person students that are here. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, I think, I think trying to balance the two, it's a learning experience, but what's amazing is how teachers are quickly learning the skill sets to integrate in and leverage those pieces which are important. So things like communication with the parents and back at home. Being able to have a, con or a continuous like learning environment for the kids so that all of the activities are in one location. Now, we certainly have had to do training and take some time to help kids, kids know and navigate that new space, but those are learning skills. And those are obviously structural skills that kids need to have. So I think from that standpoint, it's been very encouraging through some of the training and what teachers are doing to be able to establish some of those routines that have the benefit of interaction, communication, organization, and then being able to do some online assignments. Thank you. Any other tech questions while I got? If, if I could just add on to that related to what Chris is talking about. Uh, so the board, I think you're aware, but so that you know the amazing work Chris and our tech department have done along with Stacy to make sure a budget supports a uh, significant increase in technology. Some of the quiet things that Chris and his department have done behind the scenes, um, we have many families that have not had good internet access Chris and his team have hand delivered hotspots to those families, to some areas, some apartment buildings, so that all of those students can have uninterruptible internet access. Um, also, our students that have been in the CAP Plus program, um, so those students have been wearing masks, and they're Zooming with a teacher and classmates who aren't wearing masks, and they found pretty early that they didn't feel they could be understood as well as their classmates and their teacher. So Chris and the tech department tested and then very quickly got every one of those students an individual mic so that they could remain in their daycare setting wearing their mask but interact and be understood well with their classmates. So that's been such a great thing for those kids to feel they could fully participate. Thank you. And, and just to quickly add on to that, I, I, I do want to reiterate, this has truly been a, and it continues to be a joint effort um, no matter what we've done on our end in any piece, we know that there's tremendous amount of work from families on their end to make sure that they're supporting their kids. It's new learning for parents, it's new learning for you know, an instructional method. So those pieces are moving along, but what we're trying to do is at least anticipate what some of the constraints will be. Again, whether it's bandwidth, um, we're still working on some things with home connectivity that we're continuing to look at. Every which way we can try to have a consistent experience for every kid. Again, there are a lot of variables in place um, in different environments. And so the more we can mitigate those or try to reduce the differences, the more we can provide an equitable experience. So it's an overall goal. That's what we continue to try to work on is, again, appreciating the work and support, knowing what our barriers are, and then trying to address those, you know, either whole scale systematically or one kid at a time. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. we, if we exceed budget, Send the bill to Rich. Yeah, well, He's that may you. be another conversation. <laughs> All right. Um, are we back speaking to Rich? Are we back to you? Yes. Uh, thank you. Yep. Oh. Just going back to the hybrid model um, for a minute, um, looking at the two days and that type of thing, I'm just kind of curious as to why in the younger, because again, I haven't been there in a long time, but you know, last time I checked, K through five, let's say, predominantly can stay in one classroom, right? They don't necessarily move like in the middle school, they don't go to science here, math there, English, and all those types of things. So, I'm sorry? Yeah, yeah. Um, but so why wouldn't we, in, that, in those situations, look to just go five days right away in terms of instead of a hybrid two day. They're, they're segregated, they're in the classroom, they're in a controlled environment, they're not moving around. Why wouldn't we just go to a five days for those younger classroom, you know, for those youngers that are probably more at risk than the middle schools of, in the sense of, 
distractions, right? It's harder for a first grader to stay focused on a monitor than a, probably a sixth grader. Opinions may vary, children may vary, but you know, for the most part. So if you're talking a five day full program, we can't maintain the six feet distancing, right? So we can't have a full class of students and maintain six feet distancing between students or between them and teach their teacher in a classroom. That's why you have to have only half of the students at a time in order to keep a six foot distancing situation, okay? So that, that's really the, the main reason at this point. Okay. All right, then looking at the overall, you know, and looking at what Chris was just talking about, the technology and things of that nature, it sounds like we're doing a lot of learning as we're going along here, right? And so I'm trying to backtrack to August to make sure that whatever we're learning now, we could have learned back then, but we're learning now. So when we decide to go to full, what new learnings are we gonna to have to experience then or delays? Or have we done all the learning we can to this point so that we don't have delays? Yeah, we know how to do full in-person learning, right? That's what we typically do. So- Yeah, uh, but it's gonna be different. It, it, it'll be different because you're still gonna have remotes in that Cor opportunity. Correct, correct. Right. We, may, we may still have some um, who choose um, full remote um, and they'll be able to continue to live stream in the way that we are. Um, we will likely um, have some opportunities if those families choose um, to reorganize into full remote classes with a remote teacher, but that would be something we wouldn't wanna force on a student cause it, cause it would cause them to change a teacher. But we believe we'll have some opportunities for that if those families wanted to move into that structure. Maybe last question, extracurricular activities. So I know I approached that in my subject here, but it seems like if we're no one going back to a hybrid model, we should have already made decisions on what extracurricular activities, you know, again, may not be athletics, but just groups, clubs, whatever, can be provided. Yeah, so that's, um, yeah, that's a really, I guess it's a, a decision made, right? So right now we have our cross country teams. We have um, a, so, a small selection of clubs throughout the district, depending on teacher interest. There's a book club at one school. There's a science club that started at another school in remote experiences. Um, and we move forward uh, in the same way that we always have. Teachers propose a, their club um, or sport or whatever it may be that they want to sponsor. At this point, they have to be able to say, and here's how I can maintain the six feet distancing, keep our hands washed, whatever those um, guidelines uh, happen to be at the time. And if they can uh, employ those guidelines for their club, their club can happen. Um, some are waiting um, to do their clubs because they want the students on site for those. Um, but some have already started and they're doing it remotely. Kind of like our Science Olympiad, which the board is very aware of, is very popular um, activity throughout the district. Some of those Science Olympiad groups are already meeting because they meet in groups of two or three and they do a lot of their practicing offsite at home. So the, some of those have started as well. One question, I know, I see November 20th is that date where, where they have to, parents decide to come back. Obviously in our discussion, we're finding out, right, that we may have to renegotiate with the teachers or whatever the situation is. I just wanna make sure like, obviously let's say we get the 75% that we know that wanna come back and we end up with 25 back and then in, in November, it's those, those 25 that are out there saying I wanna stay remote suddenly say I wanna come back we don't have to re-go back and renegotiate with the teachers at that point in time. And then we have another barrier that we're gonna hit because of a decision. And I just wanna make sure like when we negotiate this, it's going to be a, hey, if come November 20th, everybody decides to come back. Because I think as people get more comfortable, we may see that, right? But I just wanna make sure that we don't have another barrier that on November 20th we're having to say, okay, now we have another renegotiations. I just wanna make sure I understand how that works. Yeah, thank you. No, that, um... No, that conversation should more likely, will more likely focus on, are we ready to move forward and, and not stick to a six foot distance? Hey, Lori. Uh, sorry, Scott, did you wanna say something? I'm, so, I'm sorry, Anisha, I didn't mean to step on you. 
it's hard to it's hard to see. No, you could jump in. Sorry, <laughs> I didn't hear that. Do you want to jump in? Well, just to just to uh, piggyback on, on Chad's comment, uh, the it. ATA is one of the committees, right? If that's correct. Uh, yeah, I think I heard you correctly, Scott. The ATA is one of the committees. Yes. Okay, so they they're reporting back regularly to their members um, as this is progressing. So, um, in a perfect world, that shouldn't be an issue, correct? Correct. So they continually, yeah, they continually communicate back to their members, and. Um, so that's not going to be, you know, they're not going to get surprising information, but they also gather from their members. How do they feel about, you know, if it, do they feel this is now an unsafe working condition? And if so, then we need to um, work on it from that angle. Okay. Just, um, I mean, that's convenient that uh, that they're part of the part of the, the process. So there there should be no surprises. Absolutely. Yep, they've been part of the conversations all along and one of the committees that we've been taking diligent time to talk to. Anisha. Um, Lori, what would you say to the concern uh, as an education system across the country, right, that most ca university campuses are shutting down before Thanksgiving and the concern uh, from the community also, you know, we're starting in so late, you know, we're going in October 12th and October 19th, whereas many campuses are shutting down before Thanksgiving because of the talk of the flu season going up and the concern there. So how would you address that one? And maybe I'll, I'll, throw, I'll, I'll answer that one and then I'll have another one. Yeah, and I think uh, our, our, the doctor who spoke tonight also addressed that. So I have three college age students. Their campuses are all currently remote learning. Um, but as the doctor expressed that when we um, often see an increase on um, college campuses uh, with positive COVID cases. It's because um, our young adult uh, children aren't wearing masks, are gathering in large groups, aren't following the safety protocols. Um, and that would be different in a community um, of students and, and the community of Arlington Heights that uh, does have that interest of making sure we stay uh, in person and therefore willing to wear masks and follow those safety protocols. Okay, yeah, we hope we'll keep, you know, the community continue to follow all the safety guidelines. And, you know, Laurie, during this time of change management and crisis management, we see that there's a, a lot of gaps in information or, and, or the anxiety comes in because parents don't know what's going on and they need to plan at home and so forth. So what is your communication plan and the district's communication, communication plan to to maintain complete transparency of this is how we're going forward. Is there going to be weekly emails going out? What are the updates going to be? So that everybody's in the know and there's not this fear of, oh my gosh, I don't know what's going on. Yeah, the, definitely there's gaps in, in information. The other thing that we can struggle with for, in giving families information is our information changes consistently, right? Our IDPH guidelines get updated. Um, the guidelines, as you saw, many districts that had hoped to start the school year hybrid and then in mid-August had to go remote as our guidelines change. So we also are trying to be careful, and I'm not great at this, but careful of not taking people on the roller coaster ride, that today's information is final when we know tomorrow that can change. Um, I tend to take people on the roller coaster ride and that can be unsettling for people. So um, we need to keep working on that balance of making sure people know there's no information to hide here. Um, it's everybody's information. We just want to make sure it's solid when we share it. But we're going to continue. Um, we provided some dates in the past and they'll be in the brochure that goes out tomorrow. Those dates show um, when the transition, the transition advisory committee meets every Tuesday and it shows dates that they'll will report out to the community um, from that committee. So at least on those dates. Um, and then Adam Harris has been encouraging me um, to do a, a short um, but frequent kind of podcast or short video that can go out almost on a weekly basis just saying here's new information here's where we're at um, so we'll look at that structure as well all right any other questions be they ones we talked about already or Oops, sorry. Tell you. All right. Thank you, Lori. 
and Chris and everyone for your input and patience. Um, all right, now I have uh, our next agenda item we're going to move to is I need a motion for uh, the calendar update. Mr. President. Yes. I Aaron. move that the Board of Education approve the calendar update for the 2020-2021 school year as presented. Thank you. Second. Anyone? Thank you, Chad. All right. Is this you or Brian presenting the, the calendar? Um, I'll put on the right section, so um, I will. Um, oh, Brian, are you available to talk to it? I'm afraid you took my copy. Uh, no. I saw you eagerly waiting to come into the room. Check. All right. Thank you for letting me come and talk on behalf of this request to make another calendar change for this school year. Um, this is coming on behalf of the Remote Learning Committee. Um, and then I took it back to the calendar committee who is also in support of this change. And the change, as Lori has already talked about this evening, is to put our two remaining remote learning planning days on what is currently October 8th and 9th, our parent-teacher conference days. And then take our parent-teacher conference days and put them on Thursday and Friday, November the 19th and November the 20th. So the request on behalf of the Remote Learning Committee and supported by the um, calendar committee is to make that shift in our current calendar for this year. Uh, share for the board that uh, remote learning planning days do, are not days that need to be made up. So this doesn't change the ending calendar date for our students. So our end date does remain the same. Okay, yeah, great point. All right, we all had a chance to look at that. So any calendar related comments, questions, or concerns? I have a comment. Okay. Um, and I think, Laura, you might have already addressed this, but I, as you were reviewing the, uh, this earlier, it occurred to me that it is a good idea that the parent-teacher conferences take place after we have had some in-person learning and we can see how everyone is transitioning. So from a timing perspective, I think that makes good sense. I think the teachers were also excited to have an opportunity to see kids face-to-face, -face, get to know them face-to-face -face before they have an opportunity to meet with parents and talk to them about their children. And then the only other thing I would add is that the uh, remote learning planning days, October 8th and October 9th, would be non-student attendance days. They count in our calendar as student attendance days, but we wouldn't be planning instruction for those two days. I will at my house for whatever it's worth. <laughs> All right. Question, comment? Yeah, I have a quick Nisha? question, uh, Dr. K. Um, so, you know, I, I know in previous calendars, it's in-service days are always built into the calendar. So would these two days be replacing those, or will those in-service days still happen? Great question. So the state gave every school district in Illinois five remote planning days that are totally in addition to the school improvement and the institute days. So these are, we used three already in August, and these were the two remaining, again, that will help us plan for our transition into the hybrid model. So we didn't lose any institute days, we gained five new ones. Yes. Is the state compensating us for those five days? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know the budget side. I'd have to ask my partner. No. <laughs> of course not. <laughs> All right. No comment on the state finances. We'll be here till May. Uh, all right. Any questions or comments other than that on the calendar? So let's go ahead and begin voting. Let's start with Rich. Yes. 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 And yes. All right. Well, Thank you. Six zero. You're welcome. Thank you, Brian. All right. Any other? Let's see here. 
But that's it. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for your time and patience and input and continued patience. What's that? Oh, yes. So the, uh, the, the board has uh, spoken and Brian, the board has spoken, the board has spoken together and Brian has directed me to add additional um, board meeting dates so that uh, they're more frequent than our typical once or twice a month. So I'll be sending out to the board um, proposed dates um, and really the purpose of those will be more ongoing updates um, on our process to hybrid and to uh, in full person. So I'll be sending those out to make sure board members are available because again, we have to have four me people present to have a meeting. And once the, you can all agree on those, we will uh, share those with the community as well. Those do need to be open public meetings. All right. I need a motion to adjourn. A motion to be adjourned. All right, thank you, Chad. Anisha, second. Thank you. All right, thanks, everybody.